It's happening. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do to get started is we are going to do a whip around and what we want you to talk about is uh, if you could share your name, the school that you are currently teaching at, what content area you're with, um, slash grade level if that's applicable to you, um, and then what are ways that you're currently differentiating and when you're thinking about that, what's working really well and what's more challenging. So I'm going to give everybody about a minute of think time for that um, and then how, what we're going to do is I'm just going to like, if somebody wants to volunteer, they can to start. Otherwise, I will just randomly uh, pick someone and then we will popcorn out. So once you are finished, go ahead and choose somebody else to uh, take over after you. So minute of th Okay, do I have anybody who is just itching to kick us off here? I will. Awesome. All right. My name is Joe Curiel. I work at DCIS at Ford, and I am a technology teacher in the STR. Um, the ways that I differentiate is preferred seating, how uh, my computers and lab are in groups where I have a combination of um, higher and lower and medium kids that they can help each other, which works very nicely. Um, I also have the, the students that have really gotten the assignment. I have them as tech helpers that can go around and help the other students that are struggling a bit. And um, for our IEP students, I have differentiation on their assignments. Um, and I don't call them out and say, oh, you only have to do mm -hmm. But I go to them and said, I want you to do this, this, and this. So they're not, um, you know, pointed out as, oh, well, why can't I have an easy assignment like that person? Um, what's challenging is keeping everybody at the same pace. For example, if I'm doing a project-based um, assignment right now, and there's some that are already on their slides, there's some still on their forms, there's some that new students. We've gotten a ton of new students. Um, are they responsible for the assignment from day one? This is like a five week project that I'm working on. So that's my challenge is trying to keep everybody on the same page, which is difficult because not everybody can work the, at the same level. So there you go. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Somebody else. Um, my name is Larkin O'Dell. I work at Academy 360 um, in Montbello. I'm an ECE three to five model one teacher. So it's an inclusion program. So we have 10 slots for kiddos that are neurotypical and then six slots for kiddos that um, have IEPs. Um, I feel like our whole program, like my whole program is all about differentiation. Not only like is a three to five developmental, like a huge difference, but um, the fact that we have a lot of students who um, are emerging speakers um, and variety of developmental delays. Um, similarly, I have- Well, I'll share, Matthew. So um, I stole this idea from some really fabulous- Sorry, I think somebody else was on mute. Okay, sorry about that, Larkin, uh, go ahead. Okay, I think we have that. Uh, Larkin, did you want to finish up there? Sorry for the interruption. Understood um, what I'm confused about or what <laughs> I need more practice with. And then they just I, jot that I'm down. Finish, um, just, they okay. only put their name on it if they... Larkin, are you in another Google Meet? You might need to exit that like leave that other Google Meet. Yeah, she needs to leave the main. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Multiple tabs open. I apologize. No That's worries. <laughs> um, our school also only uses Zoom, so Google Meet's always like a. <laughs> okay. Um, 
similarly, we got six new students in the last two weeks, all with IEPs, and they're pretty low. So I've actually had to like redo my entire afternoon programming for differentiation. Um, and I think it's like making materials for me that's like the biggest challenge. Um, but what's working is that we have really strong data collection systems right now, um, which is really helping me see where that student's at and where their strengths really are and um, how I can better support them. Awesome, thank you, Larkin. Hey, my name is Kathy and I teach second grade ELAE all content at Samuels Elementary um, with the new CKLA literacy curriculum when it comes to skills, um, something that I'm doing for my students. So there's a portion where <clears throat> the students read from a decodable text. And I, I have, I wanna say a third of my students who, Mama? who can't access grade level text. So I've been using Seesaw to record myself like reading the chapters for them, reading questions, um, any kind of independent activity in their skills workbook. I've been having to <clears throat> um, provide like a digital version through Seesaw <clears throat> and then record myself like reading all of the questions, the answer choices. Um, it's working for them because then they feel like, oh, I could actually do the work along with my peers. And then towards the end, when we wrap up, they can <clears throat> contribute, they can answer questions. And the one thing that's challenging is making sure I have enough time throughout the day to like prepare all of those extra materials. Um, and another challenge for me is like during the time when students can partner read together, I, it's like, how do I get a, um, a high reader to partner up with someone who is not yet reading second grade text? And I don't want sec those who can't read it to sit next to someone and they're both having headphones on and just listening to it. That's not partner reading. But if I partner <clears throat> with different levels, then there's one student who will have to read the whole, the whole chapter. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how I can incorporate <clears throat> partner reading to kids who can't access grade level text. Um, and, you know, making sure that they're, they're feeling successful and that they're involved as well. Awesome, thank you for sharing. I can go now if you want me to. Awesome. Yeah. Um, my name is Andy Collins, and I'm a third grade teacher at Bradley International. And so I differentiate in lots of different ways. Um, I was reminded of Tech Helper. I have Tech Helpers. I have Reading Helpers. I have Math Helpers. Um, I do a lot of collaborative learning. One of the things I learned, I took some Kagan class a long time ago for differentiation. And what it had was shoulder partners where they're high. They're not the high and the low. They're the medium and the lowest. And then the medium low and the medium high are together. And the medium high and the lowest are together. So they kind of collaborate with the not putting the high and the low together. So the low kids don't feel as challenged. Um, the other thing I do is differentiated spelling in our reading groups. So we have a on level, we put our lowest group at the beginning of the year on a lower level, and then we move them up at the middle of the year to on level. And then my high kids are working on fifth grade level words. So we just differentiate based on their needs for their phonics and where they're at. Um, so that's my differentiation. Some of the things I do, Technology-wise, um, I'm really trying to utilize it more. I feel like a lot with writing is differentiated automatically. And same with tech, like my kids who are catching on fast, they're now making Canvas and sending me Canvas on their own. And they're just into it because they love it. So it's, you know, I just try to, but I do agree that what one of the things hard is keeping them on the same level all the time. So what I always do is I have, this is what we're doing. This is what you have to get done. And then if you're done, these are like the six things you can do otherwise. And that way they get their own voice and choice and they can go on to do other things and help themselves. So it seems to work pretty well. I do have some really challenging kids this year as far as home needs that are a couple of girls that are homeless right now. And then, um, 
just I, I have four IPs in here and one um, 504 that's pretty challenging. So it's been a bit of a hard year as far as my students, especially on the spectrum or that are really low cognitive. I feel like that's where I feel like I might not be meeting their needs as not enough. And then I also have some really high kids who are get highly gifted that I have one girl that's reading on fourth grade level now and just trying to figure out how to challenge her up in math because I feel like she could do more than maybe I'm meeting her needs. I'm, those are my challenges. I do use iReady for that to just send lessons, but it'd be nicer to have some more concrete things for them to do, I think. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. Um, I, I can go next if nobody else is. Yeah. Uh, my name is Lisa Hellman and um, I am at George Washington High School. My content area is science. Um, one of the ways, and I'm, I'm kind of looking at this on a, on a macrocosm level because of, of what we're facing for next year, but one of the ways I'm differentiating this year is rather... Um, in every in every academic or content unit that we're doing now, I have built in an option not only for like the traditional kind of um, 2D assessment, but for every unit, the kids are also creating um, a model to kind of put together the pieces of everything that we've learned about in the unit. Um, and I've gotten a lot of positive feedback in, in terms of that being a summative assessment, kind of integrating all the pieces together um, and I also love the fact that um, that's encouraged a lot of collaboration because these models are, are created with other people in heterogeneous groups. The difficulties become like tracking individual data when, when I have kids working together on this summative assessment, like how do I know who really has mastered it, who has not, if they are creating this product in collaboration with other people. Um, and the other aspect that has been really challenging is that um, I've, I've witnessed a lot of my kids just defer back to explanations without using visuals and really integrating all the pieces together, despite having like a clearly defined rubric of, of what pieces they need to have. And part of the reason I'm really focusing on this is that we are in a move as a school to kind of eradicate the levels of of science um, in our freshman and and sophomore classes so we are going from having multiple leveled science courses down to one so we're facing next year having a curriculum that meets the needs of of kids through the whole gambit while still trying to prep some of our kids for for ib in their junior and senior year so like how how do we create this curriculum that works for all of our kiddos Thank you for sharing. Anybody else want to share? Okay, well, I, I know that it's a virtual meeting and uh, people have different situations and stuff, but I really appreciate everybody sharing out. We really wanted to be intentional about having time for everybody to share your ideas and your challenges um, so that we can start the learning with what you all are currently doing. And I love the ideas that we're already hearing and the challenges that we have for differentiation and you all really wanting to put students first. Um, to, to that end, uh, when I think of differentiation, I, I really think of uh, myself sitting in, in rows. Um, I started at a school that did not really serve my needs. Um, and I was there from kindergarten to second grade and I was not identified uh, as I was then when I switched schools in third grade as having multiple learning disabilities. Um, that made me uh, really struggle in school. And um, I distinctly remember all the way through just being like, don't call on me, don't ever call on me. I, I don't want anybody to know how stupid I am and that I have no idea what's going on. And I remember like looking at worksheets and being like, I don't know. And then I tried to ask friends around me so that I could fill it out. 
Um, so when I think of differentiation, I think of all the other students that are like me um, that really struggle. But uh, I will say then with some wonderful teachers um, and a lot of hard work and special educators who helped identify me and give me uh, targeted instruction, um, I now have a master's degree, right? So like I went from that kid that was not reading on grade level that struggled in basically everything to being able to succeed and uh, um, be able to work in education and um, and so when we're thinking about differentiation uh, think think of all the little loops out there in your classrooms and it sounds like you all already are thinking about those students and so I really appreciate that um, as we delve into this work today um, so here is a, a short video on differentiation Please. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but can I ask you if you have any specific thing that you remember that your teacher did that really, really helped you? That was like a uh, aha moment that was like, wow, that really made a difference. Yeah. So um, one of the biggest things that made a difference for me was being able to receive um, sheltered instruction when uh, there was concepts that I really struggled with. So my special ed teachers were wonderful for me because my classroom teachers were having a hard time differentiating for somebody who was so far down. And the special ed teachers then would pull me at certain times, like uh, spelling was always a huge struggle for me. And so I'd always receive uh, small group instruction um, on that. I will say too that, uh, you know, when I was in elementary school 30 years ago, um, differentiation was not really a thing. It was a lot of sitting in rows. Um, and so like I love the model now that we do with a lot of station rotations um, and like even doing like the partner reads and stuff that we've already heard about. Um, those are all things that really break it down to me. If you, you're going to put me in a room of 25 people and expect me to learn uh, with my ADD and other learning disabilities, I just really struggle. So small group instruction, being able to be pulled for targeted concepts were big ones for me. Yeah, I will say all of the strategies that we heard about earlier, um, I didn't get any of those strategies when I was going to school. So yeah, great on you already. <laughs> so my question is that, you know, we, we identify the students. Um, I'm in, I was in the same boat loop. Um, but, you know, I've got my master's and three other degrees, but it takes me three times as long to mm -hmm. do an assignment than anyone else. So why doesn't our district do the same differentiation as we would for students? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I, I appreciate the collaboration already this morning and I um, appreciate the discussions and breaking things down. We're trying to be really intentional with our professional learning of having these breakout rooms on targeted areas. We're trying to have uh, the connections in the smaller groups and have uh, have wonderful um, interaction with smaller concepts so that we're trying to actually put that in. Um, what always baffles me is putting 100 teachers into one room and having them sit and get for an hour or two or three sometimes uh, and then wonder why then they aren't carrying out that, right? So um, we're trying to, at least as ed tech, and I know academics as a whole is working on um, really breaking down some of those sessions and making them super interactive um, going forward. So um, I appreciate all the call outs and uh, thank you, Angie, for asking what worked for me. Um, I'll also put a plug in, like we, I, I will speak to our team specifically, I can't speak to other teams in Central, but we really look at the feedback that y'all mm -hmm. provide at the end of the session with those surveys and we try to implement as many things as like y'all are saying that you want and need from that feedback so if you're sitting in these sessions and you're like you know i'm really not getting out what i need to get out of these please let us know in the feedback because we take that and we adjust our sessions with that feedback All right, I love it. I appreciate all the questions and everybody coming out off of mute after a three day weekend. So um, here's a video, I'm not gonna play it just for time so that we can move on, um, but it is uh, just how, how we can break things down for our students, make sure that each student is receiving the individual attention and the differentiation that they really need um, and the why behind that as we've been discussing so far this morning. 
So to you know connect everything to our my responsibility mindset, we're really focused in this session on that like collecting student work, looking at data, analyzing those results, and then changing our instruction for the kids that we have in our you know current population. And that's going to differ from year to year and from class to class. So we are going to take some time to learn about a couple of strategies that um, you know, are accessible to everybody in this meet and are just quick things that you can share with your students to be able to like get those differentiation pieces in. Um, so if anybody wants to just highlight how they've used tech in order to support their differentiation. We heard some um, stuff about Seesaw use, which was really awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, making things available to students who, you know, can't or don't have access to like those grade level text and tasks. Um, what else are we doing with tech to support differentiation? Um, I've used um, like the, and I don't know if this is really tech, but the differentiation option on Schoology to, to assign different assignments to different groups of kids. What I haven't figured out is really how to streamline that and create like one group of kids where I routinely am just a, rather than individually go in every assignment and be like, okay, these kids need this, these kids need this. Like, I wish there was a way to just lump, right? And maybe there is, and I'm just not understanding how to do it but like i individually do it every time um well so lisa maybe. you're in the right session because we're going to talk about that um for an one platform that my school uses is iStation um and so i use iStation and i differentiate by assigning kids different um activities based on the data so some kids might need more letter and sound knowledge and practice. Some kids might need more alphabetic decoding or comprehension or reading fluency. So depending on where they are with their um, early reading skills, then I <clears throat> assign them different activities to work on throughout the month. And then with the Seesaw, when kids are responding to any type of literacy activity, I use, <clears throat> I use that, um, by I, allowing them, some students I'll say type out your responses, while other students I tell them to use the microphone um, to record their responses. And then for phonics skills, I use a lot of seesaw activities and I'll differentiate by sending different activities. Some kids just need to sort out words based on the vowel sounds, but some kids who don't need that practice can do word search or <clears throat> other um, like other more challenging skills activity based on their level. One thing I used this year with one, I have a little guy that's on the spectrum and he just locks up when he has to write. He's got all these bazillions of ideas, but getting them from in here to out here just is so stressful to him. So I used voice to text this year, which he did write, end up writing a great story. However, I don't know for sure if I can use that on CMAS. So that's one of my questions. I'm trying to, I think I talked to the school psychologist and he said he can probably put it on his 504 plan, but I'm not sure. So that's one thing I did this year that was different in class. One thing that um, I do is I go directly to the classroom teacher and ask them where what are where are your students which students are of a concern um, you know in the lower grades especially and as far as groupings um, I reached out to the teachers and I asked them if would you please put together groups of three because they of all people know their students and they can different help me differentiate what I'm doing with the particular students in groups that day or week or project. So I'm I really rely on the classroom teacher. Yeah. 
Anybody else? Those are all really awesome examples. <laughs> I know, I love it. We have a lot of experts in the room. I know, right? All right, then I really appreciate everybody sharing out. Great idea so far this morning. Uh, to circle back to our grade level text and task work and saying, what do we really want to see with our students in the classroom when we talk about that big bucket of the grade level text and task? And here's, here's where it's really broken down for the classroom look for, um, which is that teacher is monitoring the student work. Again, to what you all are speaking about is monitoring where your students are. Um, that's largely through data um, that we are doing that. And then it's also that teachers in just instruction that improves, deepens, observes students, um, including observed students of color, students with disabilities, and students that are multi-language learners, content and language. So really uh, changing instruction based off of the data that we have and observations to really help our students access that content and language and to grow and thrive as we want to. So before we hop into our tools, we really just wanted to ground ourselves in like the different ways to differentiate. And as we are going through our tools, what we want you to keep in mind is just the like, okay, how could I use this to differ differentiate? Would I differentiate the what, the how, or the end? So when we differentiate the what, uh, we're differentiating content. So this could be students get to, like maybe you're teaching a lesson on animals in third grade and you want your students to do reports on animals where they're you know looking at articles they're putting together resources one thing that you can do to differentiate is differentiate by choice so students could choose what animal that they're passionate about learning about um, you could also do jigsaw and expert groups so this is another way that you can differentiate the content that students are learning they can then be the teachers teach that to the rest of the class um, and also, this is where you can have those data-based assignments come in. So you know that X student group is looking really sharp on this strategy, so they're going to have an extension activity, um, whereas Y student group is, you know, they're just at the cusp, so they need a little bit more support with those. You can differentiate the type of assignment that you're giving them um, with content. The how is the process, so that's how they're taking that in. So traditionally, this is like the scaffolds and supports that you provide. It can also be additional time. Um, Kathy's killing it over there with her audio text options. You can also um, include like the manipulatives or the hands-on supports because we know that all of our students learn differently. So giving them the options to learn in their way, that's gonna make the most concrete sense to them. That's us di differentiating the process. And then the end is the product. This is where we see the most differentiation of how are students showing you what they know. And we are really trying to get to a space where it's not one size fit all. You have to take this multiple choice test and that is the only way that you can show me that you know this content. How can students have a voice in you know, showing you the content. And that takes some planning on you and your teams to say like, what are we looking to assess in students? Am I looking to see where my students' writing skills are? If I am, then, you know, they probably need to write. If I'm looking to see, do they understand, you know, cells and the makeup of cells? I don't necessarily have to have them write for that. I can have them make a model like Lisa's kids do, or I could have them, um, make a video or a Canva assignment. So that's different ways that we can, you know, warp in differentiation to our instruction. So as we go through these tools, we just want you to think about what specifically you could use that tool for in differentiating in your classroom. Are you going to differentiate? Are you going to differentiate what, how, or end? So with that, we are going to differentiate and say, uh, you can follow along with us and hang out in this room. We're gonna be walking through um, Google Classroom, individually assigned, as well as how to do that in Schoology and 
Uh, we're going to be talking about read and write extension for accessibility uh, using technology. So we're going to be doing that, but you also have the option to work independently. So we have uh, about 25 minutes left until we're going to be back at the main room at 9.15. Um, and there are some resources here um, for working through this at your own pace if you want to turn off your camera and work on that, that is totally A-OK. -okay. Um, again, a link to the slide deck if you want to go through the resources here. Um, but if you want to hang out with us, we'll be here and we're going to dive in. So uh, 9.15 back at the main room if you want to work on that. Um, so one of, one of the most powerful tools that I know for differentiation for our students um, and especially our MLLs and our students with disabilities um, is read and write. So read and write is a really, really powerful tool and we have read and write two different versions. One is that we have a premium version for every single teacher in DPS. So I'm going to drop in the free teacher version. If you do not have this, this is wonderful to model in front of your students. Um, so here is the sign up. Um, you can sign up for that put in that you're a teacher and within um, usually about 10 minutes, you will get the access information to uh, turn on your own premium. All students in DPS that are using Chromebooks, which is most of our students, have read and write the free version included on their Chromebooks already. So what is the free version? Is that we have the basic features here that are in this box here at the bottom left. Um, is that it will read the screen to the students and that will go across any website that goes across PDFs, it goes across all of our platforms. Um, and so it will just pick up the screen and then you can actually see here is a little screenshot of what it looks like. It highlights the sentence and then goes through each word as it goes along. Uh, little Luke in elementary school would have benefited wonderfully from this because I had a lot of the struggles that you all have been sharing with about that decoding skills, um, being able to uh, read a grade level text and have that option. So we want to put grade level text in front of our students at all times, but sometimes they might have a little bit of trouble accessing that. So we do want to have that grade level text in front of them. And here's a tool as to how we can uh, differentiate for them. So that is available for all students. We also do, thanks to Denver voters, have um, premium features available for all students with disabilities in DPS. So part of our last bond was accessibility technology. So if you have any students that have an IEP or a 504, they can get um, a premium account turned on that gives them all of the wonderful stuff. So I'm going to drop that in here. And that's if they have language goals written in, correct? Yes. So if they have a, a language goal of some kind, they can have this. So like Angie, you were talking uh, specifically about a student who might benefit from having this. If it is written into their 504 plan, here's where you can just type in their information and uh, get them turned on the premium version. That will then be whenever they log into a Chromebook anywhere in DPS, they will get the full toolbar that you are seeing there. Even on CMAS? So it, it is not on CMAS, but the tools are very similar on CMAS. So in CMAS, if it's written into their 504 or IEP, we can get um, accessibility uh, tools turned on in CMAS, in addition to some of the things that they already have. Um, that does not count for the ELA content, though, because they are expected to read that on their own. That is a question that we had. So. Um, I know there's Lexia. The district had Lexia at the um, last year through the SPED department. Yep. And then I have some kids that were low, lower, you know, level readers, and they wanted it. And our SPED teacher here said it wasn't available for them. However, I don't know if that's a true fact or just what she said. So yeah. I'm curious about. We're curious about that. It. We've been talking about that. Yeah, so Lexia uh, is not supported by the central funds anymore. Um, as part of the reorganization of central office last year, that team went through some restructuring um, and doesn't have that as a, a 
tool for them, but we do have read and write for all students that have IEPs of 504s with language goals, which is most of them. Um, and anybody can fill out this form. So if you're a classroom teacher, a specialist teacher, whatever, you can fill out this form for your students. It doesn't have to be the SPED teacher or the 504 coordinator to be able to turn this on. Now, there are just tons and tons and tons of features within uh, Read and Write that I would love to be able to take time for, but instead I'm going to give you a playlist here that walks it through, and all of these are uh, community-facing, so you can teach your students the features if they have this turned on um, by having them watch these videos. Uh, we break down every single piece of the tools and use it with content. Um, so that you can be able to see that. So um, went through the screen recorder, but there is also like uh, visual um, visual vocabulary that pops up with images. Um, it has tense text simplification um, and a whole lot of other things. So read and write is just a really really powerful differentiation tool. Uh, free premium for all teachers. Free premium for all students that have 504s and IEPs. And then the screen uh, the screen. Um, reading is available for all students in DPS and is already on their Chromebook. You know, Luke, one of the, my favorite things about Read and Write is that it doesn't just read the text aloud to students, but it highlights. So as you can yeah. see in that like screenshot right there, it highlights the line that it's on and then each individual word as it's reading it. Yep. Um, so students can, it's so much easier for them to follow along than just like having it read out loud and then they get lost. Yep. And I, I know a lot of students that are on grade level, but they just like to be able to read along with it um, because it's it's walking them through. It's not just doing all the work, but it is going through it with them. Same. I, I can't hear without subtitles. <laughs> yeah, I always watch TV with the subtitles on too, right? Yeah, I have a question. With the read yeah. and write, will it be able to read like what's um, in Seesaw for students? and highlight it or no? Oh, that's a great question for Seesaw. So I know that in Schoology, it, it does. can. Um, sometimes you'll run into issues with it because it'll look at something as a PDF instead of a web page. So for your students with accommodations, they shouldn't have issues with the access. But for our free versions, we might run into some. So Kathy, I'm, I'm going to research that and then I'm going to email you and copy your coach Matthew, which who I know you're working with, um, to get you an answer on that one. That's, that's a great question. We should okay, play with this too. Yeah, for sure. When I create my um, my activity for the, the, the decodable text, I tend to, I don't take a picture of the text to put it on because there's no way to highlight, you know, the, the words. They just mm -hmm. listen to my voice as I'm reading it. But my teammate, through her MacBook, she figured out a way where she, like, it'll read it, and then it highlights the words. But then it's very robotic. Yeah. We're like, oh, I wish we combine combine them both, because then you can hear, like, my um, the, my annotation, like, the way my, my voices change, yep. you know, like that, versus, like, just hearing a very robotic, like, there's no emotion in it. So we're like, how can we combine both so that the kids can see the words as it's being read to them, but then they can hear like it's animated? Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've seen teachers do um, is they'll turn on read and write, but then mute the volume and like record it with a screen recorder. So then like they're reading it with their voice, but they still get that highlight and word by word. So that might be helpful for you. Okay, great. I'll try that out. Thanks. And I, I will say that uh, Text Help, which is the company that uh, creates Read and Write, works very hard to have fluent native speakers um, going through it. So it's not as robotic as a lot of other computer voices are out there in the world. It's gotten much better. Yeah, much better. Jill? Um, I have desktops in my computer lab, and I would love to have Read and Write on them. How would I go about doing that? Um, you should just be able to use Chrome on the, on the desktop. Yes, yes. So if, if the students are signed into Chrome, then wow. the extension will follow them. Right. The, I, get, I get the extension, but right now I have just the uh, generic student login. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, so if you want this, the students just have to log into their Chrome, which I know login issues can be a, a trouble with students, right? I, I had that uh, same desktop lab in uh, uh, K-8. So, um, yeah, if you want the, the tools, then they can just log into their Chrome browser. They don't need to necessarily log into the computer with it, but they need it into the browser. Okay, we can do that. And also, um, we use Illuminate in our 3.5. Yeah. Um, how, and, you know, some of the kids have figured out they got the free version, and they will use the free version on Illuminate, but they don't have an IEP or um, 504. So how do you turn it off? You don't turn it off, but what you can do yeah. instead is you, what, what I recommend, just overall is logging out and so instead of using the web version of illuminate you use the app version mm -hmm. and that would disable any sort of like third-party apps for them but illuminate isn't on our apps it definitely should be so let's talk <laughs> let, let's touch base afterwards because that should be an app that all students have access to yeah it's it it should be in the launching apps before they log into the chromebook i know where exactly where it is okay not there. It's not there. Okay, so then we can make sure that that's added to your Google uh, group. Uh, okay. So we can follow up with that. Yes. That'd be great. I have one quick question because I'm trying yeah. to share that read and write with my um, my, my admin and my um, SPED teacher. Yep. And so I just want to check in about it. So it's bought by the district, the extension, the premium extension for all IEP kids to have. Is that right? Yep, IEPs and 504s as long as they have a language goal. So, like, if they have an IEP, okay. Yep. If what they about have an MLL? IEP for, and for MLL, it's by request. Okay. Uh, so right now we're doing a pilot of uh, of five newcomer schools where all MLLs have the premium. Um, but as of right now, that's not universal across DPS just because of funding. Mm -hmm. Um, but we do have that bond funding for anybody with a language goal in there. Can I, um, can I share it to my um, to my ELA people, or would it be better not? Um, <laughs> you can share. It's just the free version that they're going to be able to have right now. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we're trying to work on expanding that for all MLLs across the district. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great questions. I'm glad you guys are as excited about reading right as I am. I love reading right. So, and again, like thinking of myself here is like this would have been a massively powerful tool for me to have as a student, um, since I had so many, uh, so many problems as a kid. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about individual assign. Um, so I'm going to start with Schoology, and then I'm going to hit Google Classroom really fast. Um, but I'm actually going to take over presenting so I can just yeah. like demo. Okay, so the individual assigned feature, um, both in Schoology and Google Classroom, is just a way for you to push assignments to students that are differentiated and they have access to their assignment and not necessarily like all of the other assignments. So I know that when I started teaching, I like had the different colored copy paper. And so like there's the red worksheet and the blue worksheet and the green worksheet. And it's super obvious to kids that they have different worksheets. And then they start to ask all these questions about like, well, how come I can't have a green worksheet? So when my school adopted Schoology and we really started to get into it, I found the individual assign was so game changing because I can push that assignment out to the students that need it and they just see that assignment and it can be titled the exact same thing and it has whatever supports or scaffolds built in that I need them to have. Um, also super helpful with uh, station work that I would do and differentiated projects. So the first thing I like to start with is that you can individually assign in Schoology to you know, one student at a time. If you need one student to have this one resource, maybe they joined mid-semester and you had like a catch-up 
assignment for them so that they can you know be on track with the rest of the students in the class you can just push that out to them no other students are confused about this like random assignment that they now have um, you don't have to explain it 50 times they don't have to do that it's for x student um, but if you're like me you're probably differentiating to pretty similar groups you're pushing out like assignments that are scaffolded in specific ways be, um, due to IEPs, 504s, um, anything like that, for groups that are going to remain pretty consistent, you can make what's called grading groups in Schoology, and it saves so much time. So to do that, all I do is I go to members here, and I'll have all of my members. Just a quick note, if you have linked your courses in Schoology, you will have to make grading groups that are specific to each of the sections. So I can't just have one big grading group um, that says like group one and have students from different sections in there. I'll have to make different grading groups for my sections. So I'm in my 8 a.m. Se section right now. If I wanted to switch, I would just use my drop down to get to this section over here. But all I need to do to start a grading group is click over here in my organize members and grading group. I'll have this button that pops up to add a grading group. I'll just give it a title. And then I can select the students that I want in that group. I go ahead and hit create. And now I have my grading group here. Now, if I have students who you know, need to be added to this grading group later, or I need to remove them and switch them to another group, I can just click on my gear icon, edit, and then I can click on a student to remove them if they're already highlighted in green. And then to add them, again, I just go through and click the student that I need. So then I hit that create grading group again, it'll save it. And then I have all this stuff. You'll also notice that once I create that grading group, it shows up on that student. So I can have a student in five different grading groups if I want to, and it'll show me right here what grading groups they're associated with. However, they will not see the name of that grading group. So students won't see that they're um, a member of Thundercats here. That's just for me, for my knowledge. So I could name it um, whatever makes sense to that population of students. I'm gonna pause. Lisa, you have a question. Yeah, so so when I'm, and I'm, I work with linked classes, right? Um, mm -hmm. So when I'm doing an assignment, then once I have those groups prearranged, I would just select each of my prearranged groups from each section and assign those out separately. Is that like, I can do that at all one fell swoop. I don't have to go back Correct. Assign. Okay. So I'll demo that actually great segue right now. Um, so what I can do is when I'm building out my materials here, I'm going to go to add a material. I'm just going to add an assignment real quick. And I'm going to create the assignment as I normally would. And so then when I go to individually assign, it's going to be down here in my options bar. And I'm just going to select this little triangle piece that says individually assign. And that's going to bring up, don't know why it like brings it up in a weird place, but then it goes back up here. And I'm just going to start typing in a name. So I can start typing in the name of a student. and I can individually assign that way, or I can type in the name of my grading group, and that'll save there. So once I assign that, I can go ahead and create that assignment, and only the students in that grading group or that I assign it to will be able to see it. That also means that only those students will be able to get a grade for it if I make it a graded assignment. So when I go into my grade book, you'll see that I now have this. Because I did not assign this assignment to these students, I can't even enter a grade. It doesn't let me because they have no access to it. The other thing that's really helpful here is you can individually assign entire folders of materials. So this is what I really like to do if I have like 
projects that are going on where my students have self-selected into projects and those projects have very specific resources that I need them to use. Instead of them getting super confused and bogged down in like, I have to choose from 15 folders. I individually assign their folder to them and then they have everything they need without getting confused about like where to go. So to do that, I just go ahead, get my folder here. I'm going to create it. I can then go to my settings bar over here and select individually assign. And then I can add individual students or my grading groups. So is it also then a good idea? So like, let's say I have two different versions of an assignment. Do I then need to create a Schoology grading group of to keep from assigning, like, let's say I have a, a differentiated assignment and then I have the other assignment that's going just out to the class. Do I need to create a group to keep the kids that are getting the differentiated assignment from getting the generalized assignment I'm just pushing out to all the kids? Yeah, so if you only wanted, like, the students to receive their specific assignment, you would have, like, Group A is your general group. That's like the base assignment that you're sending out. And then you have group B, which is the differentiated assignment. So if you want those group B kiddos to only get the group B assignment, not the group A one, you have those two separate groups okay. set up. Any other questions about individual assigning Schoology? Thank you so much. That was super, super helpful. I'm so glad. Is this primarily used for middle school and high school? Because I can't see my kids going in, uh, you know, kindergartners, first and second graders going into Schoology. I usually yeah. use the Google Forms. So I would not recommend Schoology for our elementary students. It is right. a more secondary platform. However, if you are looking to push out resources to elementary students who need a little bit more than Seesaw can provide in terms of like what assignments you're attaching. Google Classroom is what I recommend using. And so while Google Classroom also has individual assign, it doesn't have as many like beefy features as Schoology does. So you can individually assign an assignment to a student, but you can't utilize grading groups or anything like that. So when I go into my Google Classroom, I can create a uh, assignment right here. And then again, I just go in and where it says four, I can individually assign by selecting the students that I would like to. Unfortunately, can't use grading groups. Um, they don't have that here, but they do have a plagiarism check. So like, mm, it's a trade off there. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, and we're going to be creating more and more resources around Google Classroom next year, um, as a lot of our schools will not have access to Seesaw, given that it's switching over to um, school budgets. So we're going to have a lot more resources uh, to come on Google Classroom as we really move towards that being our K through five option for a learning management system. Um, and with that, we've had such rich discussion that we are totally rocking it today and have used up all of our time in this breakout room. So we're going to jump back into the main room. I'm going to drop that link back in here in the chat. Um, really appreciate you all um, and sharing out the great, wonderful discussion that we've had here today. Um, we'll be doing a debrief all together and talking about our next steps and thinking about how we can differentiate for our students. Thank you all for your wonderful participation during this session. We appreciate you.